Welcome to the newest episode of Beating and Bangin'. I'm your host, Kyle Dalton. In today's video, we've got stories on a couple of Kyles, including one from Kyle Bush's crew chief, Randall Burnett, and the remarks he made on Sirius XM NASCAR radio that I had never heard before about the two-time Cup Series champ. And after I heard them, I thought to myself, that actually makes a lot of sense. We have another story on Kyle Larson and the remarks he made this week on Corey LaJoy's Stacking Pennies podcast about the force of his impact at Atlanta. And I'll just say, Hendrick Motorsports has topped Denny Hamlin and Joe Gibbs Racing in this ugly category. Speaking of Hamlin, we're going to wrap up the week and wrap up the conversation on his strategy decision at Atlanta with the latest comments from his crew chief, Chris Gabehart. And for fans of the number 11 car, it's not what you want to hear. And finally, we'll wrap up with my thoughts on the milestone of this weekend's cup race at Watkins Glen, the 100th points paying race in the next gen, gen 7 car. I have my top three things from those first 100 races, and it's a little preview of a story that I'll have in Monday's video. And stick around to the end of this episode because we'll have a cool giveaway of something I know many of you guys will love. However, before we get to that, let's go back to Wednesday and Randall Burnett's appearance on Sirius XM NASCAR Radio. The veteran crew chief makes a regular weekly appearance, and this week he reviewed the solid performance of the number eight team over the weekend in Atlanta and how Rowdy was the only non-playoff driver to finish inside the top ten. Burnett also discussed the good run the team has had since the Olympic break, but I thought the most interesting thing he had to say was when Danielle Trotta asked him about his relationship with Bush and whether the driver is someone who is blowing up his phone via text at all hours of the day and night with his thoughts on improvements for the car, or if they just stick to their regimented schedule of meetings and time at the shop and the driver lets the crew chief handle the rest. No, he's uh, it's a little bit of both. You know, um, we're very regimented about uh, when we have our meetings and, and what we're talking about and um, it's very detail oriented about, Hey, let's get to the point. Let's, you know, not drag us on everybody has got work to do. Um, but then, you know, I'll be at the house or we'll be doing something and I'll get some, some text late night, if, you know, just random times. Hey, what about this? Hey, I was thinking about this. Um, what's funny is his memory is, is very vivid. Like he can remember things that we did last year to like a certain T to make the car better. He can remember things that he's done years ago that he just keeps in the back of his back of his head. So, um, you know, he's got a, a great memory and he can, he can kind of pull things from that, that it'll, that'll surprise you at times. Hearing Burnett's remarks was eye opening to me because I had really never heard anyone talk about Bush's memory like that. And when you think about it, it makes complete sense in tying into his success. For starters, he's run over a thousand combined races between the Xfinity and Cub Series. So his notebook is huge. But based on what Burnett said, Bush has a vivid memory that allows him to remember things from last year's setup to even years ago that can only be of help to the team. Now I can just envision the driver using that memory to think about lines and races at specific tracks and how they change or how certain drivers make certain moves at certain points. It's intriguing to me to think about how Bush's memory can really work to his advantage. Moving on to our next story on the other Kyle, and we're talking about Kyle Larson. The 2021 champ sat down for an extended interview with Corey LaJoy on his Stacking Pennies podcast this week, and they talked about his first race in the playoffs, which ended in that ugly crash where he slammed violently into the outside wall. Larson talked about it and made an interesting revelation. Would you like to relive it? We have the in-car camera. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, wow. Oh. God, it looks... So you said you were wearing mouthpiece sensor? Yeah, I think it was like 43 Gs. Um, honestly, like the, the hit from Briscoe hurt almost as much just because I wasn't expecting that. 43 Gs. When I heard that, my first thought was, damn, that's a big hit. And then second... I remember Denny Hamlin's crew chief, Chris Gabehart, talking about his hit at Richmond last month. So I went back and found the clip. Every time you have a significant enough incident that, um, you know, warrants a further look into the incident data recorder, NASCAR will send you the data for that incident. JGR has had 21 of those instances in the Gen 7 era. 
21 times we've gotten data from a crash from one of our four cars. Do you want to know what the highest recorded G spike in the history of Gen 7 was for JGR? It was Richmond in the 11 car. 32 G. Saturday, Sunday night, this past Sunday night. So, Sunday night, 32 wow. G spike in the wall off of turn four coming to the checker flag. Highest ever recorded. I might add higher than the one that unfortunately put Kurt Busch out of, put him in retirement ultimately at Pocono. Higher than that. So Hamlin's was the worst in 21 crashes of the Gen 7 car for JGR, but Larson's was considerably worse. That got me thinking, and I wanted to see if there were other impacts since the car debuted in 2022 that might have been worse and that were public. That's the key. NASCAR doesn't make this data public. Trust me, I tried. I asked the sanctioning body for the data from all the teams after Gabe Hart's comments in August, and they declined. Fortunately, I found a fantastic article on G-forces in NASCAR crashes on the website Building Speed, which is run by Dr. Deandra Leslie Pilecki, who covers NASCAR for NBC Sports. Definitely encourage you to check out the site. The story included data for Gen 7 and previous generations of cars. Let's start with the Gen 7 crashes, and there are two that are notable and public. Unfortunately, they both belong to Ryan Blaney. One of them occurred earlier this year at Daytona in the duels, when he got clipped in the right rear by William Byron and violently slammed into the wall. That one recorded 55 Gs, so even worse than Larson's last Sunday. Incredibly, that's not Blaney's biggest hit in the Gen 7 car. That came on the previous trip to Daytona in the 2023 regular season finale when Christopher Bell pushed Ty Gibbs, who turned left and got into the right rear of the number 12 car, which sent it shooting up the track for a massive impact into the fence. That one measured a whopping 70 Gs. So how does that compare to other impacts before the Gen 7 car? There are a few others that are notable, including Kyle Petty's 2003 crash at Bristol, which was reportedly around 80 Gs, and Elliot Sadler's Pocono crash was rumored to be 86 Gs. But the biggest one I could find was actually not a cup race, but Kyle Busch's 2015 Xfinity race at Daytona, where he told reporters that he sustained 90 Gs during the impact. I think now is as good a time as any to remind myself and everyone else that these guys have balls of steel. Just the thought of such a big hit makes me cringe. But these guys willingly do this every Sunday knowing this or something terrifyingly worse could be the outcome. And I also want to give a shout out to NASCAR for the safety of the car through the years. Fortunately, we haven't had another fatality since Dale Earnhardt, and that speaks to the safety of these cars because as we've seen, they've taken some nasty licks and the drivers thankfully get out every time and talk about it. Moving on to our next story, and we're going to circle back to Hamlin's crew chief, Chris Gabehart. He made his weekly appearance on Sirius XM on Thursday, and unsurprisingly, one of the main topics of conversation was his driver's conservative strategy at Atlanta. Here's what he had to say about it. Well, certainly the start of the race, we were both on the same page with, you know, Atlanta has proven to be volatile early on. You know, we had a wreck a couple laps into the spring race. It took out a lot of good cars. And, you know, with, with starting last, if we tried to run up through there pretty quick, there's a good chance we could have been in that wreck had it happened. So, we were both on the same page with let's lay back for a couple of laps, make sure that everybody understands what their car has and you don't have any early race mistakes that could take us out, um, you know, as a, as a bystander. I didn't expect the rest of it to be as conservative as it was on his behalf, um, and we didn't plan that together. Um, I wish we would have changed our, our you know, I wish we would have. I wish, had I known that was more of an issue uh, in his head, I would have done my best to, to talk through the scenarios ahead of time with him. But having said that, in the heat of the moment, Atlanta, and more so than Talladega and Daytona, is a, is a game full of 51-49s. There's no 60-40s. There's no 70-30s. There's no 80-20s. Like, you're... <laughs> You're you're either going to kind of be in it or you're not at any given second. 
And in the heat of the battle, what I could do was support my driver and, and his decision based on what he saw and felt in the moment um, while telling him several times throughout the race, at some point, we're going to have to try to get through that hornet's nest. Um, you know, and so that's that's the decision I chose to make in terms of supporting him and, and what he felt like he was uh, needed to do at the time. Gabe Hart supporting his driver in the heat of the battle doesn't surprise me. But hearing that the crew chief and driver weren't on the same page is very surprising. Here's why. For a while now, we have heard from Denny about how he's been so successful with Gabe Hart because he looks at Gabe Hart as the coach and he is the quarterback. They come up with a game plan before each race, then execute it with the coach making in-race adjustments and the driver quarterback implementing them. At Atlanta, based on both Hamlin and Gabe Hart's remarks, that did not happen. Gabe Hart later said in the interview that it was Atlanta specific and there wouldn't be any issues going forward. But how can he be so sure? I'm fairly confident if you would have told him last week that his driver would effectively go rogue during the race and do his own thing that he wouldn't have believed you. It's an interesting dynamic for sure and one that is worth watching this weekend at Watkins Glen and in the future. And finally, my last item for the day is this weekend's race at the Glen is the 100th points paying race in the next gen Gen 7 car. I reached out to multiple folks in the industry, including drivers, media members, and NASCAR to get their top three things they think of when reflecting back on those first 100 races. So before I share those in Monday's video, I thought I'd share mine now. Let's start with number one, and it's related to something I said earlier, and that's the safety of this car. There's been an evolution over these first three years. That first year, concussions were an issue, a big, big issue, which unfortunately ended the career of Kurt Busch. But to NASCAR's credit, they listened to the drivers eventually and started making changes, adjusting the crumple zones and softening the front and rear clips. Concussion issues aren't really a thing anymore, and thankfully so. The second thing I think of in the first 100 races is parity. And by parity, I'm not necessarily talking about the lower teams winning races, but the closeness of the field overall. The drivers talk about it all the time, how everyone is so close and it's hard to gain an advantage. But that's resulted in some spectacular racing, especially on mile and a half tracks and some history making finishes like this year at Atlanta and Kansas. And my final thing that I think of when reflecting on those first 100 races is pit road. Pit road was always important in the past, but now with this car, it's a top priority because it's a main way for cars to gain track position. We've seen it time and time again, where the race off pit road is often the determining factor of who wins a race and who doesn't. I know some fans don't like it, but I love that because it truly makes it a team sport where the pit crews are vital to a team success, just like the driver, crew chief, and the car itself. Be sure to watch Monday's video where I have the responses of multiple drivers and others in the industry on their thoughts on those first 100 races. And finally, we're going to end the week with a fun giveaway. And it's another item that I featured in my Father's Day gift guide back in June. It's called the console vault. You may have never heard of it, but it's something everyone needs and that's protection in your vehicle from auto theft. The console vault is an in-vehicle safe designed to protect your valuables and firearms that is built from heavy gauge steel with a choice of locking mechanisms. Each hidden car safe is easy to install and created to meet automotive manufacturers stringent quality standards. There are hundreds of different applications designed for light trucks, SUVs, and select sedans across many makes, models, and years. This is a really cool product, and if you're in the market to protect your vehicle from theft, which everyone should be, I definitely recommend you go check them out at consolevault.com. In order to be eligible to win your own console vault in this contest, all you have to do is write CV somewhere in the comment. That's it, just CV. Thanks again to Console Vault for this fantastic giveaway. All right, guys, that's a wrap on this episode. I want to get your thoughts on all of it. Let me know what you think about Kyle Busch and his memory and how you think it has played a role in his successful career. And what did you think about the item from Kyle Larson on his impact at Atlanta and where it ranks compared to other big crashes in the Gen 7 and previous cars? And lastly, what do you think about Chris Gabehart's remarks yesterday on Denny Hamlin at Atlanta? 
is it cause for concern for the number 11 team in the future? Thanks again for checking out the latest video. I really do appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of your day.